everyone before we uh, turn to God's word. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we just, uh, we bow before you, our hearts, our, our bodies, our souls, our minds, everything, Lord. You say that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind, Lord. And even with the little strength we have at times, Lord, we by faith, Lord, we reach out to you. We worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you that you, Lord, your word says that the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro throughout the earth, uh, seeking those whose hearts are diligent, whose hearts are uh, perfect toward you. And this is what we want right now, Lord, as we open ourselves to hearing from your spirit, Lord, your spirit, who is our teacher, and we thank you, Lord, that you said that when the spirit comes, he will lead you into all truth. So we, we're excited, Lord, by that. And we thank you, Lord, that the truth sets us free, sets us free to worship you, to praise you, and to, to be who you created us uh, in the first place to be, Lord. So thank you, Lord, that you are a redeeming God and you are at work in all of our lives, Lord, the, uh, as you, you said. He that began a work in you will complete it. So we bless you and we praise you and we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Shabbat Shalom. Happy Sabbath. Uh, happy Saturday, everyone. Uh, good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon. Wherever you are, it's four in the afternoon here on a, a cloudy day, but a, a, a nice, uh, what do you call it, overcast day. Um, we had an earthquake, uh, re, uh, I think it was a couple of hours ago. It was actually a major earthquake in Turkey, but we felt it here. Nothing, no damage. Don't know what the situation is in uh, Turkey. Um, but uh, I, at our prayer meeting last night, prayer for Israel meeting, talked about some of the things that are going on, including a week ago, how uh, the number one Iranian uh, nuclear scientist was assassinated. A few days later, a top general in Iran was assassinated. Um, and we're, so we're on a quite high alert at the moment, uh, waiting for some kind of retaliation. Um, so, uh, but you know what? We, we need to be on alert always as believers, yeah. uh, especially in these days. Because, um, well, any day, but, you know, it just seems that uh, there's an intensity going on, especially with the elections, the uncertainty of, uh, of everything. And, um, you know, I was thinking 2000 years ago, uh, when, the, uh, when the, the Jewish people were living under uh, Roman bondage, I was thinking, I wonder what that would have liked to have been living in your own home, your own hometown, your own homeland, living under a foreign occupier. Um, and I don't know if this is the right comparison, but in a way, just imagine uh, your, you know how, the, for example, the United States and Israel, very similar, we're so divided between left and right. We have the same here, but it's almost like the fear of what happens if the person that you're not voting for what happens if he comes to power? You know, we're going to be living under that. And that, that, that uncertainty, that sense of, oh, my gosh, that dread of living under a leader, under a, under a ruler that's leading you in a way that not, not, not a personal thing, but it's, it's against God's principles, God's laws, God's precepts. What, what a scary thing that, it, that must have been. 2000 years ago. And we've, I think for the most part, you know, I grew up in New Zealand. Um, and, uh, but for the most part, most of us have never really lived under a real um, evil, a real, uh, uh, you know, some of you may disagree with that, depending on your political views. Um, but I mean, even going back 30 years ago, um, when we had a left wing politician who shook hands with Yasser Arafat. This was during what was called the Oslo Peace Accords. And um, 
you know, selling our land to this terrorist, uh, a lot of the right wingers were just couldn't believe it. And in fact, one of our right wingers assassinated our leader for doing it. If you remember, Yitzhak Rabin, he was assassinated. That's how how the divisive we we have become. So um, that's going to be a little bit uh, relevant to our our message today. The, the the message the theme, of course, is still on the love of God and the uh, receiving God's love and giving God's love. And today we're going to look at um, the story of the Lord uh, and when he he washed the disciples' feet. Um, but uh, to do that, um, we really need to know why, uh, what was the place of a foot washer and um, what was this all about? Because the Lord said to, to Peter and to the others, he said, what I'm doing now, you don't understand. Later on, you will understand. So he was, he was obviously doing something a little bit deeper than just the physical outward uh, washing of the feet. Um, but uh, one of the key themes in the talk today is the issue of defilement. Defilement. Because one of the reasons why people would wash your feet when, they, when you came into the home is because, you know, in those days, everyone pretty much wore sandals. You know, they didn't have uh, Nike and uh, Under Armour and all that yet. Um, but uh, so most people had sandals. And of course, you know, eight, nine months of the year, it's pretty hot. And so you, you know what it's like wearing sandals. And of course, in those days, they didn't have buses and taxis. So most people walked long distances. And, uh, you know, you'd arrive at a place and you, you'd obviously have dirty, smelly feet. So uh, depending on the status of the family that you were in, uh, for example, if you just came to your own house, if you came home from work or from the market or from the synagogue or the temple, wherever, uh, you would clean your own feet, okay? Number one. Number two, if a guest came over to your house, uh, you would bring them a bowl of water and a towel, and they would clean their feet, okay? Then you get the more aristocrat families or the wealthy families, and they were the ones who could afford to have a servant. And it was the servant's job, one of the servant's job, uh, yeah, one of, the, one of the jobs of the servant, uh, he would uh, wash your feet. And it really was... Um, the lowest of the low uh, to do that. Um, now, bearing in mind something very important before we uh, unpack the story. A few weeks ago, I, I included in one of the talks the importance in the Jewish world, including today. And I, I asked the question, what is the most important part of the Jewish community today. And, you know, most people would say the synagogue or whatever, but actually the most important part is the mikveh, which is the ritual baths that Jewish people take. And 2,000 years ago, it was 10 times more important. And those of you who have been on a tour, you'll know that we, wherever we went, we found ancient ritual baths and I touched on times of the year and times of the week where uh, it was stipulated in the Torah when to have a bath and let me let me just recap once a month with a with a woman's cycle she was required to have a ritual bath uh, after all sexual relations it was required to have a ritual bath. If you came in contact with anything regarding the dead, it was required to have a ritual bath. And uh, also when you went to the temple, 
uh, particularly during the three great festivals, before you took your sacrifice to the priests, you were required to go into a ritual bath. Clean, basically to clean up yourself, to clean, to, to, to have a, a, a sense of ritual purity, okay? It's foreign to our society today, but it's very important. And the reason why the Torah is so stringent and strict about this is because if you look in the Torah, there are lots of cases where one becomes defiled sometimes by uh, your own actions, sometimes by trespassing. You know, in those days, um, farmers, agriculture workers, they own their own lands, but sometimes the borders weren't marked out very clear. And so by mistake, you would go into someone's border or um, again, touching the dead coming in, in contact with the dead. And so there, there were strong, strong uh, uh, stipulations regarding defilement. I've listed a few of those scriptures. Um, if you have either your notes or your Bible, we're just going to look at a few of those verses and we're going to turn to the book of Leviticus. Okay, we get mo uh, pretty much all of the verses are in Leviticus, so it's pretty easy to go through. But... Uh, for example, in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44, and by the way, before we go into these verses, Leviticus is really a lot to do with holiness and purity. I am the Lord your God, be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. So chapter 11, verse 44 for I am the Lord your God, you shall therefore sanctify yourselves and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Well, you can do your best, but sometimes these creeping things may creep on you and defile you. So that's one case where one can become defiled. Now, chapter 15. Verse 31, thus shall you separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness, that they die not in their uncleanness when they defile my tabernacle that is among them. So the importance of coming into the presence of God during the days of the tabernacle, this was before the days of the temple, the the uh, strictness and the importance of not just coming to God. Yes, we can come to God as we are, like the old hymn, just as I am. But there needs to be a reverence. There needs to be a sense of, you know, remember what the Lord said to Joshua? Take off your shoes, the, the smelly shoes, the dirty shoes, the sweaty shoes. Take off your shoes. The place that you're standing on is holy ground. And by the way, the, this, uh, the previous verse when the Lord says, sanctify yourselves, we talked on this last week. Remember in the high priestly prayer of our Lord in John 17, when he said, Father, I sanctify myself that they may be sanctified. And then he, and then he prayed, God, Father, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is the truth. So the being set apart, part of being set apart is this sanctification from what? From defilement. Okay, next verse, chapter 18, verse 20. Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile yourself with her. Okay, well, that's obviously clear. But remember one of the Ten Commandments, it says, thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not covet. And, and the, the New Covenant teaches that covetousness is as idolatry. So when we idolize something and set our hearts on something, it actually defiles us 
It's a form of covetousness. And here's an example because it says, do not covet your, uh, your uh, neighbor, uh, your, what your neighbor has, or your neighbor's wife, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And then the same chapter, 18, verse 23, neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thy, thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is confusion. It's an interesting statement where it says it is confusion. If you look at most of the commandments against a man lying with a man, most of the time it says afterwards, for this is a confusion. Very interesting. And um, this, is, this is where where kids, that's why uh, people who are pro that kind of lifestyle, uh, they don't mind the big billboards up out on the streets when you're driving down the motorway, the big billboards, a man hugging a man or a man kissing a man. Well, you know, when children see that, or even adults, when they see that and they think it's normal, what happens? It becomes a confusion. And men don't grow up with a true sense of their gender, who they are as a man, and the same as a woman. This is not normal. It, it, it brings confusion. That's just a little side note there, but it's a defilement. It's all about defilement here. Uh, chapter 18, verse 28. That the land spew not you out also when you defile it, as it spewed out the nations that were before you. Jump to chapter 20, verse 3. And I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people, because he is given of a seed unto Molech to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. This is where uh, the uh, idolatry goes into all kinds of perversions. Chapter 21, verse 4. But he shall not defile himself, being a chief man among his people, to profane himself. Chapter 21, verse 11. Neither shall he go into any dead body, nor defile himself for his father or for his mother. And then a couple more, Leviticus 22, verse 8. That which dies of itself or is torn with beasts, he shall not eat to defile himself therein. I am the Lord. And then lastly, in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, there's an interesting passage. When Daniel decided to fast, it says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, there's nothing wrong with the food and the drink, but Daniel, because he purposed in his heart to seek the Lord, at that time, food became a defilement for him. You know, it's like when Jewish people try to keep the Sabbath, um, I've given this example before. Uh, Jewish people, uh, they won't touch money. They won't talk about money. Nothing to do with it. And I gave an example of one Shabbat. I had 100 shekels, which is about $30, in my pocket. And it fell out. I got on the bus. And I was on the way to the airport. And I realized that the money had fallen out. And when I was waiting for the bus, I was standing outside of a synagogue. And there were a whole lot of young guys there. And I said to the bus driver, I said, I wonder if any of those young guys, if they saw the money, they would have picked it up. A few days later, I was in this money changer uh, in our town. And uh, the owner there is a good friend. He's an Orthodox Jew. And I told him what happened. And I said to him, Eliyahu, I said, if you were there and you saw that money on Shabbat, would you pick it up? And he said, absolutely no way. And I, I said, really? And he was serious. He said, never, wouldn't, wouldn't touch it. And uh, the funny thing is wife came in and she said, what are you talking about? What are you guys talking about? And I told her and I said, would you? And she said, of course I would. 
I don't know. I don't know if she really meant that, but uh, we laughed. But but there's the sense that when you're trying to keep God's commands and, and walk the, that walk of holiness, if you accidentally or if you by choice do something wrong, there's a defilement. And um, of course, it can be taken too strict. But on the other hand, there's a blessing. J Jewish people believe every command you keep, there is a blessing. There has to be a blessing. Because with God's commands, there comes a blessing. That's the mindset of, a, of an Orthodox Jew. Okay? So um, it's quite an interesting mindset when you think about it. When you think that it's driven into them, that if you keep all these commands, there is a blessing. Just yesterday, I was walking downtown, and uh, this, this man, maybe 30 years old with his little son, American Jew, Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox, he, uh, I was just going for a walk, and he stops me and he said, would you like to lay tefillin? You know what tefillin is? It's the phylacteries that you put on your arm and put on, on your head, around your head, which is commanded in, in Deuteronomy 6, bind these commandments on your arms, on your, uh, between your eyes, and on your doorposts. Remember on the doorposts of your hotels? The mezuzah. And I love putting on tefillin. All you, all you do is you put it on your arm, put it on your head, and you read the Shema from Deuteronomy 6. And it takes five minutes. And I love doing it. We're commanded to do it. And um, so I did it. But these guys who work, uh, who, or rather who, who hand out these phylacteries, they believe they are fulfilling this commandment by doing it. Every person that they can stop to do this, they're invoking a blessing not only on on the people they help, but on themselves as well. And after I prayed and after I did it, um, we talked a little bit about how long I've been here, how long they've been here. And then, uh, and then after he wrapped it all up and he said, okay, Shabbat Shalom. And he said, it's going to go well with you now. He said, I know it's going to go well with you. You know, one has to be careful. Again, it's not a superstitious thing like, you know, uh, carrying a cross or, or Catholic, uh, what do you call it, rosary, or the Muslims have uh, beads with all the names of uh, Allah on it. Of course, it can be uh, superstitious, um, and we shouldn't we shouldn't um, we shouldn't uh, have a uh, what's the word um, a, 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 a sense of entitlement. You know, just because we pray, just because we do, there should never be that sense of entitlement. But in any any event, I'm waffling on. Let's get back on track to the, the sense of defilement and um, the strictness, the strictness of uh, keeping ritually pure. <clears throat> but the pr this is the problem, everyone. It's impossible. It's impossible for you and me to keep uh, undefiled, to live in the world and be of the world and simply, um, we have an enemy. We, after the fall, we have uh, an enemy within us, the flesh, which Paul says our carnal mind is at enmity towards the spirit. And the spirit is at enmity towards the flesh. So we have a, 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 um, a Trojan horse within us that's working against us. OK, and, you know, we can find defilement in so many ways, again, not just um, by going out and deliberately doing things. We can we can, um, you know, become defiled, uh, not necessarily by a, by our own fault. Uh, a few few examples of uh, of defilement. Here's a good example. Tradition. Tradition. OK, uh, you can have a, a family tradition or a church tradition and it can it can be successful and it can serve you and bring you in closer into the Lord. But what happens if a new generation or your children grow up and that tradition, it's like it's getting a little bit outdated now and the young generation that's coming into the church. You know, for example, 
if you're in a church with the old hymns, I love the old hymns, by the way. They're, they're rich. The words are deep and rich. But a lot of the younger generation, they're not into them. What do you do? What do you do? And this is where in families and in churches, there can become defilement through simply not agreeing on things like that. When you have a disagreement, there's a defilement. The, the unity of the spirit gets broken and there's a defilement. And, um, and I know churches where this has happened, where the young people, they want to move on. They want their modern style of music. But the old people, they said, no, we're not giving up our hymns. We're, we will not. And there's, there's somehow, you've got to work that out. That's just one little example of how defilement can uh, happen. Stumbling blocks. Paul, he deals in the new covenant with things that, Maybe they're okay for you, like drinking wine, okay? Uh, in our culture here, um, wine, kids drink wine on celebrations, on the Shabbat. They have a little drink of wine. My son, I give him wine. Um, in Italy, in Spain, it's a, just a big part of the culture. And alcoholism is not really a big problem, actually. Um, except for actually it, it is because the Russians who have immigrated, the Russian Jews who have immigrated here, they can't give up their vodka. So we have problems with that. But as far as the wine culture goes, that's not really a problem with alcoholism. However, what say it's, it, you know, there's someone in your midst used to be an alcoholic and you're doing communion. I'm sure you all know this example. And uh, the danger of if that recovering alcoholic has one little sip, it could get him back into going down that path. So what do you do? What do you do? Are you willing to, for the sake of, you know, your liberty, are you willing to give up that for the sake of someone else? So again, there's a good example of how defilement and uh, offense can happen. Here's a, here's a good little example as well. You, you, you should all know by now the Hebrew name for Jesus is Yeshua, right? You all know that. But I get, I get over the last, you know, 13, 14 years of being a tour guide, I get new uh, groups week after week or month after month. And mo a lot of the people that come, they've never heard the name Yeshua in their lives. And I find that when I use that name, people, they, they almost get offended. Now, you know what I could do? I could put my foot down. I could say, well, that's his Hebrew name. That's how it was 2,000 years ago. But that person, they've been calling on the name of Jesus for 50 years of their life. And they know him as Jesus. They don't know him as Yeshua. And, and it's sometimes you have to be sensitive when you, when you bring a new concept, even if it's a new, even if it's a true concept, if someone's not quite ready to take it on or to adopt it, it can not only be offensive, but it can defile. It can, it can take away the union, uh, the, the, the unity. So, um, there's another example of just being sensitive, and uh, but but how um, defilement can come in, and look, we could go on and on and on and on about how it's so easy. And look, Jesus took it so much deeper. He didn't just say you can get defiled if you go out and murder someone or commit adultery with someone. He said if you let that get into your heart, these thoughts. Well, it's just the same. And this is the problem. We have an enemy and he is a liar. He's the father of all lies. He walks around like a roaring lion and he wants to defile us. And when we become defiled, you know what happens? Guilt comes in, shame comes in, uh, condemnation comes in. Our joy can get taken away. It's very destructive. 
this concept of defilement. And then just uh, to take it one step further, um, you know, there are things that others can do to us and others have done to us, you know, in our childhood, maybe even our parents, deliberately or non-deliberately, or other, other forms of abuse and how we're defined. And, I, and I'm very aware that there are different depths of defilement, you know, uh, there are some things that we can get defiled by, but, it, you know, we can bounce back and get over it pretty easy. But other things cause greater damage or, or, or uh, wounded, you know? And words, do, do you guys in America know that little kid's uh, thing, you know, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names can never hurt me? Do you know that one? Or something similar to that? Well, that's not true. That's not true. Names and words, it, it says in Proverbs 18.21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Do you know your tongue has the power to cause death, just like it has the power to cause life? So we, look, I'm preaching to myself, we need to be careful with our words. They can defile, and even our tone, you know? Sometimes our tone can defile. How about that? And, uh, you know, uh, it, this is such a challenge. Okay, so I think I've given a good, uh, a, um, uh, a, uh, a good kind of overview of different kinds of abuse and the different and many, many ways, uh, direct, indirect, we cause it, we get it done to us. Our thoughts can be defiling if we, if we dwell on them too much. Oh, and let me just say one, uh, another kind of defilement. You know, sometimes we hold on to things that are defiling that we actually make friends with. We actually make friends. Things that are defiling, things that are not right, like idols where we covet things, where we actually enjoy them so much, we don't even see and realize that they're our enemy and that they're actually defiling. And um, so let's go to the passage in John 13. Now, last week, we talked from John 13 to John 17, and we talked about abiding in the Lord. We talked about the, the Godhead, the love. Remember the love that the father has for the son and the love that the son has for the father from before the foundations of the world. And that that same love, Jesus is going to manifest to us as we walk this out. And the Holy Spirit's job is to also manifest this love. So Liz and others were talking about if we could stay in this somehow. And in a way, our, our text today is staying in this because the Lord comes in John 13. If you have your Bibles or your notes, that's our passage, John 13. And we're starting off, uh, and this is where the Lord, uh, he is going to wash the disciples' feet. Uh, but I think it's worthy to look at a few key verses. Look at verse 1. Now, before the feast of Passover, and by the way, remember what they did to the, the priest, did to the, the sacrifices at Passover. They would inspect the sacrifices. They would inspect the lamb to make sure the lamb was unblemished or undefiled, okay? So um, it was Passover, and it says, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end, okay? This is talking about eternal love, uh, committed love, the committed love, that's a key point 
in what the Lord's about to do, his commitment to love. Verse two, and supper being ended, the devil having already put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So Judas at this stage was, was defiled. Satan had already put something into his mind and Judas dwelt on it and it entered into his heart. Uh, verse three, Jesus, and this is, this is so foundational. Jesus, knowing that the father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, he rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter. Peter said, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus said to him, what I'm doing to you now, you do not understand, but you will after. And Peter, and by the way, the Greek is very, very strong. You shall never wash my feet. Away with this. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part in me. And then actually what Peter says, okay, Lord, then wash my whole body. And the Lord said, no, he that has had a bath, a ritual bath, doesn't need his whole body washed. But your feet, you're picking up dirt as you're walking from back from the temple. You've already had a bath, Peter. Guys, this is the beautiful picture of our servant, Messiah, Savior, God. This is our, the picture that we have. Now, don't forget, not too long before this, the disciples were having a big debate and argument. Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who's going to be the greatest? You see, in those days, just like today, there's this idea of, of building your way up the ladder and becoming more and more powerful. Just like the Tower of Babel, building their way to God. And here we have this amazing picture of the Lord and the significance of him taking off his garments. Where it says, let's read that verse again. Verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. Friends, this is so important. I talked about this last week. Before Jesus was tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights, what did the Father say to him at his baptism? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then, of course, the devil tried to attack that and tried to, you know, if you're the son of God, do this, do that. And this is what the devil does. He tries to attack our identity. And if we don't know who we are, then you know what we're going to do? We're going to try to build ourselves up to be someone to be someone big, because we all have needs. We all have these needs, but we're to get these needs from our father. Jesus, it says, knowing. That's a key point. Last week, we talked about how the father, remember what Jesus said? Father, that you've revealed these things, that the, that the, that the knowledge that you have, that they would know you. And I talked about the biblical concept of knowing is like Adam knew Eve, the deep, intimate knowing. And it says, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all. How did he know that? How did he know all of this? He spent time listening. He spent time with his Father. And, uh, and because he knew who he was, it says where he was going and where he had come from. He knew who he was. He didn't have to prove that he was the Savior, the Messiah of the world. 
But instead, what did he do? He did what Philippians 2 said. He did not consider himself equal with God, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant. He humbled himself and he was setting an example for his disciples. He said, he said, you know that I've done this. Blessed are you if you do it for one another. Now, what did he do? What actually did he do? He was cleaning up their smelly, dirty feet. That's what he was doing. Okay? Now, we all know what smelly, dirty feet are. Okay? And, um, you know, like I said, in those days, they walked a lot, lot more than we do. They didn't have nice socks that absorb sweat or powder that goes in or nice padded shoes. No, they had none of this. So I'm, I'm trying to build up how smelly their feet was. Okay, but you get the point. And what about between the toes? And what about fungus? And what about skin irritations? And all of that. It's a horrible job. It's the lowest of the lowest jobs. And what about if people have got cracks between their uh, toes and you, you go to clean their feet and it hurts them? It causes them pain. And this is what Peter said, Lord, no, no, not me, Lord. And what did the Lord say to him? He said, Peter, unless you let me do this, you have no part in me. You have no part in me. And in a way, this was a little bit of a rebuke to Peter, but he was teaching them. Remember, he's the rabbi. This is discipleship. He's teaching them the importance of, number one, knowing who you are. If we don't know who we are, guess what? We're not going to be able to take off our garments. And you know what comes, came to me as I was preparing this? I was thinking that sense of making himself naked like that, it's going back to the Garden, garden of Eden. Remember, Adam and Eve were naked and they weren't ashamed. There was no need to be ashamed. There was no defilement. When we know who we are, we don't have to prove anything. We don't have to be ashamed of anything. And um, he washes their feet. Number one, he, he was teaching them, know who you are. Number two, he said, a servant is not greater than his master. Okay, so you've got to learn from the master. You've got to follow in the footsteps what your rabbi, what your master is doing. You've got to learn from them. This was the idea of discipleship in those days. Take note what they do. Follow what they do. So, um, but that going back to that verse, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Guys, this is what discipleship is all about. This is the, the work of the Lord. And we go back to that word sanctification. This is the sanctifying work of God in our lives. God wants to come and wash our feet. And we need to be open to him doing that. Okay, this is, the, this is where we have our quiet time. This is where Mary took the oil, the, 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 the oil and she washed Jesus' feet. She could never have done that unless she was in the presence of Jesus. So we've got we've to spend time with the Lord and open ourselves up and let him come in between those cracks in our toes and even the painful areas and those areas that have been defiled. And let him cleanse with the beautiful balm of Gilead. And what does it say in the Song of Songs? Your name is his ointment poured forth. How beautiful to let the Lord wash our feet. Can you imagine being the disciples and having the Savior of the world, the creator of the world, touch their feet, wash their feet? How beautiful, how amazing. And guys, 
What did the Lord say to Thomas? He said, blessed are you who see and believe. More blessed are they who believe and don't see. So just because we're not letting the Lord do it physically, there is a blessing in the spirit as we come and open our hearts and let him cleanse and wash us from these defilements. But sometimes I believe the Lord wants to use others to be vessels to do that washing. And we all know about that. We all know the need of people in our lives, trustworthy people, mature people that we can open up to and that we allow them, those people with, as I say, maturity, experience, compassion, uh, empathy, where they can be vessels of the Lord. After all, we are the body of Christ. And sometimes we can be a hand. We can be a, a, a mouth. We can be a, an embrace of the Lord. So this is also part, like the Lord said, you are blessed when I do this. Blessed are you if you also do it for one another. And, uh, and let's not be too proud. Let's not be too proud to let people, you know, wash our feet and, um, and let us, let us be open to being foot washers. And I'm not talking about literally here. I'm talking, you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people that, that, that are struggling, people that need a touch from the Lord and they're struggling finding the Lord. And we all, we all have our days. We all have our struggles. So this is a part of our core. And this is so beautiful and so deep and so healing. And so cleansing, uh, this is the sanctification, the sanctifying work of the Lord and the healing of the Lord. You know, there's a verse in Song of Solomon's chapter five, verse three, where the beloved, sorry, the Shunammite, she looks through the lattices of the window and she's so busy taking care of herself. She says, I've, I've already put off my coat. Do I need to put it on again? I've washed my feet. How shall I defile them again? She was so busy looking after herself, her self-life hanging on to herself. She, she wasn't willing to be open to the beloved. And um, because she got into a place of comfort. And, uh, and let's be honest, sometimes it's more comfortable and easy not going this route. Sometimes this route is messy and smelly and painful. Uh, and, and I think we need wisdom, how we exercise and how we receive it as well. Not saying it's, it's uh, an easy process, but uh, this is what the Lord wants to do in our lives. Now, let me just finish by saying that coming up in four or five days, we are celebrating one of our feasts. It's not one of the three great feasts, but it's a feast uh, called Hanukkah. I'm sure you've heard of Hanukkah. It has two other names. In John 10, it's either called the Feast of Lights or the Feast of Dedication. And that story is a story that happened in the intertestamental period of time between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, this was a period when the Greeks were ruling just before the Romans came. It was the Greeks. And um, the Greek leader uh, in the year 333 BC, Alexander the Great, he basically allowed freedom of religion. Okay. All he wanted was you to adopt the Greek culture, the Greek food, the Greek uh, um, mythology, the Greek language. Okay, This is where the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek, the Septuagint. Um, so, but he gave you freedom of religion. He just, again, he wanted you to adopt the Greek uh, culture. That's why a lot of Jews 
uh, took on themselves Greek names, Andrew, you know, Simon. These were not their Hebrew names. Uh, and Jesus, for example, John, these are all Greek names. Um, Andreas actually was Andrew. Um, but a couple of hundred years after Alexander the Great died, a new Greek leader rose up and his name was Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth. Okay, now you can read about this in one of the books in the Apocrypha. And one of those books is called the Maccabees. Have you heard of the books of the Maccabees? If you're an ex-Catholic, you're or you're you're a Catholic, you're in your Bible, you actually have the Apocrypha, the apocryphal books. And in those books is one and two Maccabees. And you'll read about the story. What did Antiochus Epiphanes do? He actually became a control freak and stopped freedom of religion. And he, he made it strictly forbidden for Jews to practice circumcision, to, uh, to worship on the Shabbat. And it, there's stories of him and his men finding Jews breaking those laws. And he was brutal. He used to, if he caught a woman uh, having her son circumcised, you know what they did? They would kill the baby, tie the baby on the back of the neck of the mother, and then in front of everyone in the town square, take them to the top of a roof and throw the mothers off to their death with the babies on their back. So it was terrible persecution and the Jews were living under this persecution. But the worst thing Antiochus Epiphanes did, he went into the temple just up the road in Jerusalem. He took a pig and he sacrificed that pig on the altar in the Holy of Holies. And he defiled the temple, totally defiled it. Well, that was the, the, the what, how do you say, that was the straw that broke the camel's back for the Jewish people. So a group of Jews rose up and it was actually a family called the Hasmoneans. But they were given a nickname and the nickname were the Maccabees. And the word Maccabee means a hammer. They were the hammerers because they went about fighting and hammering the Greeks and they defeated the Greeks after about an eight year guerrilla warfare. So against all odds, they defeated the Greeks. They went into the temple in Jerusalem and they said, the first thing we must do is we must cleanse the temple from its defilement. So they went about cleansing, cleaning up the temple. They got the seven branch menorah and they said, we must find olive oil to put in the menorah, which was stipulated in the book of Exodus. So they went about, they couldn't find any oil. Finally, someone found a little bit of oil put it in the menorah, and guess what happened? It burned not one day, not two days, not three days, not four days, not five or six days, not even seven days. It burned for eight whole days. Now, of course, in the scriptures, you know, seven is the number of completion, perfection. Eight usually is symbolic of a new beginning. You know, you've got six days God created the heavens and the earth. The seventh day he rested was completion. The eighth day is the beginning of a new week. Children are circumcised on the eighth day. Circumcision of our hearts is a new beginning, right? Every time we circumcise our hearts to the Lord, it's a new beginning. Every time we repent, it's a new beginning. So the Jewish people, they saw that as a sign that it burned for eight days when they only had enough to burn for one day, that God was with them. And friends, that's the story of Hanukkah. And that's why you'll see, you know, the seven branch menorah, 
is um, is in the in the temple, but a nine branch menorah is for Hanukkah, and it celebrates the 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 uh, eight days. You know what? Just give me fifteen seconds, and I'll get one. Okay, so you'll see this is not a seven branch uh, candelabrum. This is a nine branch. I don't know. Let me turn my camera down. No, I'll just hold it. Okay, so you've got the nine branches. And, you know, the idea is you take the one in the middle and you light it. Let me get a match here. Now, this one in the middle. You know what this is called? It's called a shamesh, and that word means servant. It's a servant. And the idea is you light on the first night of Hanukkah one candle, like I'm doing now. It's not the first night, but I'll, I'll light it. Okay. And you put it on your mantelpiece so that your neighbors and everyone outside can see the one light burning. And then the second night, whoop, that's gone out. The second night, you do the same. The third night you do the same. The fourth night you do the same. Okay, these are these are cheap fake candles. They're not keeping uh, keeping a light. All right, but you get the idea. And you put it on your mantelpiece, and you let the light shine, guys. But it's the servant candle in the middle that lights the other eight. And the other thing we do on Hanukkah is we eat lots of food made from oil like donuts and latkes, which are like a potato pancake fritter. Uh, and uh, so you, you're guaranteed to put on a few pounds every Hanukkah, okay? And guys, there's so much message in this story. And don't forget in John 10, it says Jesus went up to Jerusalem at the Feast of Hanukkah, Feast of Dedication. That's what the word Hanukkah means, dedication. And it was to commemorate the cleansing of the temple. And guys, as we come up to Hanukkah, and as we uh, conclude this message, let us search our heart. Let us let the Lord search our heart where there's been defiled, defilement. Remember, Paul says our bodies are the temple of the living God. So we need, God, we need to do our searching. We need to let the Lord do searching and let us cleanse this temple and let us let the spirit let the oil of the spirit burn in us and let us let our servant jesus the candle the one who is the servant who washes our feet and guys i i haven't really said much about it but i know you 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 get this that the heart of this message is our theme this is the love of God. It's painful. It's uncomfortable. It's ugly. Who wants to, to, to you know, it's so much easier letting this stuff stay buried. Or it's so much easier living in denial. But God wants to free us. God wants more and more light to shine in us. And the way I believe we get that oil. We get the miracle of the oil burning is to let God and, and help God cleanse us from this defilement so that his light can shine in our lives. And, you know, in the, in the, um, in the book of Revelation, the, the candlesticks, they were representative of the church and the Lord is going through his churches and he doesn't want to take away us from being a, a testimony the idea of the candelabra being on the mantelpiece is to let the light shine as a testimony it's a testimony to what god has done amen amen
Thank you, Aharon. Oh, oh man. That was so good. <laughs> that was um, beautiful. And um, so much that I, you know, want to share, but, or some specific stuff anyway, but I, I do want to open it up to everyone first. And so um, if anyone does have a question or a comment, um, please unmute yourself or put it into chat. I just, I just think uh, we don't, at least I don't often think about this, and I, I guess uh, I'm, I'm guessing this is one of the main reasons for all of these uh, Old Testament cleanliness rules, but it's to remind us of the holiness of God. And just to, it's just an awesome thought to think of that holiness. Uh, and then Joyce had a comment about uh, Hanukkah. What was that about the kids' presents? Oh, our son had a friend in, in middle school who was Jewish. And Tom came home from school one day and says, um, Chad, they get presents eight days in a row. Why do we only get them one day? <laughs> yeah. Good question. Good question. <laughs> it's good. Yes. And yes, John, yeah, the holiness of God. And, and it blows my mind that scripture says that we are holy and blameless in his sight because of the blood that was shed for us, right? Amen. Amen. Yeah, there's, there, let's not get confused about uh, sacrifices for forgiveness of sins, okay? Um, between the daily walking out being... You know, there's a difference between salvation. Sorry, let me start again. There's a difference between the gift of eternal life and walking out our salvation, the sanctifying process, the being transformed into the image of his son. Yeah. There's a difference. And, um, you know, uh, it says, the uh, Romans 3.23, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. That's that's our, our eternal salvation. But salvation is also something that we walk out. And that's our sanctification. So, um, and and the being washed. Because like, like when we walk through the streets, we're always picking up dirt, excuse me, dirt on our feet. We're always coming into defilement. And, and God knows that. That's why in the book of Leviticus, he, he makes it clear. Okay, this is what happens. These are ways that you can become defiled. Try to not walk in these ways. But if you do, there are ways of, uh, of being cleansed. And I think the, the idea of the Lord washing the disciples' feet, he's taking it a, a, a step deeper and further uh, and where, where he wants to get right into our souls, our our very being is very, very deep. And it's, it's, um, it's, as I say, it's not always so comfortable. Yeah. I, I, you know, if I can just, if I can um, just add before you say something, Liz, I remember, I don't know, 25 years ago, I went to a school of counseling and um, after the first day, one lady, she didn't come back. And, um, the, the director, he said, has anybody seen such and such? And no one knew. The next day he came and he said, he said, uh, uh, she, she didn't want to come back. She said on the first day, uh, something hit a nerve and it touched on things from her past and she couldn't handle it. And she didn't want to come back. Sad, but understandable, understandable. There are, there are some things that are so, so deep. Um, yeah. Anyway, Liz. No, well, um, when you were talking just now, it just, um, you know, confirmed that the feet versus the hands. So Jesus could have used any uh, extremity, any part of our body to demonstrate, you know, servanthood, how we are to allow him to serve us and wash us. And we are to serve others. He could use our hands, but he used the most 
impossible part to wash, the dirtiest, the smelliest, right? Yeah. You know, when you think about it, because look at like the condition of our souls, you know, it's not pretty, it's not pretty. And I want to get into that a little bit, if I may, Aharon, because that is what really is hitting me in this lesson is what are things that actually defile our temple that we need to um, allow the Lord to, uh, you know, shine his light on and to uh, take back any territory that the enemy has gotten through open doors, through things that we've done or um, past generations. But, um, but anyway, yeah. So um, when you were talking about defilement, well, I'm going to give someone else a chance now, but I have something else on defilement and um, I'll open it up again to anyone else have anything. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I have something. Um, I think, Aharon, the part uh, regarding Peter and Jesus, what struck me is the word allow, give permission, that we have to give permission to God to go to enter these places. So many times we defend the ground that we are in and the things that we've been involved in in the posture of our lives. And allow Jesus to go into those dark places and bring the light. So I think it's so critical that we just give it all up to Jesus, that we say, Jesus, wherever you go, wherever you take me, wherever you want to do with me, I give you permission to do it. Search because we, we defend our ground. We defend sometimes traditions, sometimes sins in our lives. Um, and that it's okay. And I, I, I think that is a big word here is allowance and permission. And the other thing about feet, feet take us to these places. They take us to good places and they take us to bad places. And I think obviously when we wash feet, we're washing off especially the bad places that our feet have taken us to. And they go, they transport us to good and to evil. So I think that's a critical piece too. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, John. You know, as you were talking, I thought about what you said, um, how, how we need to let, uh, invite the Lord and uh, allow the Lord. Um, but just for some reason, my mind went to when, when we're going, especially with someone close to us, what about when they're going through a foot washing uh season in their life and it's very painful and of course the ones that are closest to us they they affect us usually the most and and sometimes when we're going through these seasons um and it all comes out whatever the all is whatever it is uh, we can see the ugly side of that person and this is really this is a challenge this is a challenge that um when we see that other side um, you know, we gotta we gotta understand the process that they're going through as well, because because we want we want people to love us through our season of foot washing, but we we've gotta we've gotta give grace as well when we're seeing those close to us um, going through the same. It's not easy. Yes, Tracy, you have something. Um, you know, I, for some reason, I. Aaron, from the first time you mentioned the word, word defilement, I was uh, immediately, my mind went to the scripture in James 1, um, where he's talking about what, what God considers as pure religion. And um, so many thoughts are going through my head. But um, as I, if you go back to chapter 1, um, starting with verse 19, um, it's really talking about obedience and, and, and discipline um, for believers. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness mm. and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Um, and then he goes on to talk about being doers of the word. Um, and at the end of that chapter, 
uh, verse 26, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Fa God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Uh, that, um, that, that scripture just kept coming to me. For Jerry and I, that has been a foundational scripture for um, our ministry. And although, you know, we, God is in the sanctification business, we have to participate and we have to be available. And, and, and in this season, especially here in the U.S., Iran, um, there is so much anger and there is so much vomit just being just, just thrown out there and, and, uh, um, and, and coming from the body, coming from, from people that we know love God. And, um, uh, and, I, and I, I understand it, but we have got to, we've got to come to that cross every day, every single day. There is, we cannot stand on our flesh. If we think we can stand on our flesh, we will be sorely, we will be shamed because we can't. But um, that is just the scripture that came to me today as we're talking about defilement what God considers um, pure. Amen. Um, so good. That is yeah, so good. Really good. Yeah. So many of us are walking around, you know, we're talking about the shaking and the wheat and the tears. And so many of us, and, and I'm throwing myself in there, have a tear mentality, although we all consider ourselves wheat, don't we? You know, but yeah. we, um, it's it just a, I don't know. I'm going to have to chew on this for a while, I think, but it was um, really good, Aaron. Thank you for this teaching. Yes. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, in some ways, the, 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 the soul searching and the foot washing is the Lord weeding out any tears within us because, yeah, we can, we can have uh, those. And, and that parable, it's interesting where the Lord, he says, this is where the devil sows in the world. And the devil does, he has sowed into our lives. And, and Liz touched on that earlier, where the enemy has taken, taken ground and defiled us. And, and, and we want to gain back that ground. We want to win back that ground. Like the, like the Maccabees, when they went into the temple and they cleansed that temple up and they got that oil. Um, this is the, the cleansing. And I think there's a verse that says, you know, before God's going to send judgment, he says, Judgment first begins in the house of God. So this ju judging is it 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 can actually be a, a good word if we if we know that we fall into the into the loving hands of God. We shouldn't be ashamed to let the Lord judge us or to judge ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Amen. Well. Um I, if I may, um, share my thoughts, Aharon, about what we had briefly spoke about as far as soul care, because I think what we don't realize is all the things that can defile this temple. Because truthfully, I don't think the church, you know, has been discipling us in this way. Um, and they avoid um, casting out demons, which was part of Jesus's ministry. He healed the sick and cast out demons. And that's what he tells us to do. And when you were talking about defilement, it caused, caused me to go to my notes um, that were sent. At, I don't know if some of you remember, but um, John and I have been um, doing a program called Soul Care over the past few months. And, um, and I've been doing other things for years. <laughs> so much to work on. And um, with, you know, I just want to, I just want to read and, and just put this out there. And then Aharon, where you take this, you know, is in the Lord's hands, right? Well, this is all whatever. But I just feel that with this group, that this is something that the Lord does want um, to be made available, this type of soul care for each and every one of us, so that 
we can be set free from any strongholds, any habits, um, any traditions, any anything that is holding us back from really just being filled with the love of God so we can be the light. And by the way, I have my menorah. Ah, you know? Great. And you know, one thing I didn't realize was that, um, you know, that, is this true? Okay, so is this true that um, Hanukkah was only mentioned in the New Testament, not in the Old Testament? Correct, yeah. And, and that it's really for Christians really can also be, you know, um, celebrating Hanukkah because it is in the old, you know, the New Testament and Jesus represents the light. And so we are supposed to celebrate Hanukkah and we are supposed to, you know, let the, every time we light a light, we're supposed to let that light represent the light within us and share the light in, into this world. So maybe you're gonna have a little Hanukkah um, message. Uh, so, so how about next week maybe we just light the candles and we'll say a few things and maybe we can bring a little everyone can bring a little something and at the end we can just say a prayer and, and eat something and, and celebrate but I, I don't think it's a case of we should celebrate I think it's just it's there it's an invitation and there's a blessing when we celebrate because right. it points to the Lord it That's points right. to the Lord. He did a miracle. Obviously, that, that oil could not burn for eight days. They only had a little bit. It's, it's the miracle and how, um, and how the, um, the courage of the Maccabees to rise up against these, uh, the Greeks. They'd had enough, and they rose up, and um, they, uh, of course, they, they trusted in the Lord. Because one has to be careful with the Maccabees. For a lot of right-wing extremist Jews, the Maccabees are kind of almost like their heroes um, and their justification for nationalism, extreme nationalism. So there's a there's a fine line there between, you know, like Joshua, for example, uh, he went in to the Holy Land and to drive out the enemies. One has to be careful not to use that for nationalistic purposes um but uh, seeing the spirit of it where they did it in the spirit of god um that's where we can celebrate what the maccabees did so yeah we let's let's uh, do a little celebration next week but i actually um at the end when we're when we're finished doing our talking i actually have a little video three minute video clip of something fun that i wanted to show so when we're ready i can I can show that. Great. And if anyone has children, grandchildren, there's a great book um, that we read at kids, a, sh a kids shelter last year. It's called Maccabee, the story of Hanukkah. Um, it's a great, great story. You know, it's gr well done. Very well done. Um, okay. So what, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, uh, one other thing, like when you were talking about defilement, you were talking about, um, you know, our words, right? How our words, but what the Lord has been also impressing upon me for a while now is our thoughts because our thoughts become our words and our words become our actions. So it starts up here for me, you know, this is where, yeah. and, and you know what? I, in the soul care, uh, it was, there was something about one of the takeaways for me was access. So a thought comes into my mind. Now I'm gonna either speak life or death. And I have a choice. Do I give access to the enemy or access to God? And that just like really hit home to me because something recently happened and the thought came in and I had to really battle the mind and change that thought because I did not want to knowingly give access to the enemy on that. And so, so here are some of the things that the soul care has you start thinking about, praying about, letting the Lord search our heart about. And there is a program, and I'm not sure where it's going at her on with that, but hopefully um, you're going to be integrating that into the evangelism and discipleship ministry that you're going to um, have available to us. But, but think about some of these things that cause defilement to our temple. Unforgiveness, that's 
we know that. Um, witchcraft, like, you know, playing with a Ouija board, something as simple as that, as a kid, unknowingly, oh, can open an, you know, a door to the enemy. Tarot cards, um, you know, seances, uh, secret societies, Freemasonry, you know, our past generate our dis descent, our um, ancestors, and we've had that in our family, Freemasons, ceremonies, you know, sometimes a family means a blessing, but when it's not in Jesus's name, it could be, a, you know, curses, sexual immorality, abortions, suicides in our family, patterns of fear, abuse, sexual or emotional abuse, addictions, family secrets, curses, all of these things can defile the temple. And a lot of it also, again, we don't even have, uh, you know, any personal um, responsibility for. Some of them can be in our bloodline. So soul care gets into this. And so if I may ask, you know, if anyone is interested in, in, in pursuing a course like this called soul care, where it starts, um, you know, going into some of these areas that we, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't really know through the, the church, you know, it wasn't through the, well, it is through the church, but anyway, so putting it out there and then praying about it and see who would, you know, be interested in, Aaron, are you going to talk anything about, about the evangelism and discipleship, or is that coming up later? I think, yeah, let's you and I discuss it more and pray more about it and see where we're going before we discuss it. Um, yeah, not, not, nothing at this stage. All right, because, because um, I'm sure, I don't know, I'm not going to speak for anybody else, but um, Aharon has a, a lot of gifts that we want, <laughs> we want you to share. And, uh, you know, as evangelism, and um, discipleship, you know, two very important, you know, for us being equipped to, um, you know, to get out there and do God's work. So, mm -hmm. so is there anyone else that has any comments or questions? Um, it's getting late. It's it's ten thirty. I know it's. it's getting you know, late. one one things that you mentioned, uh, Liz, from the the soul care. There can be other things even more subtle. Like, you know, with what's going on with the elections, you know, I like to find out what's going on in the news. But just lately, it's like I'm feeling defiled by mm -hmm. watching too much news. It's like I, I can't. I got to turn it off. Yeah. Just even something like that can, right. can be a defilement. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah, that's yeah. a good point. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right, well. well. I'd like to show um, yeah. if we've got three minutes. We do. Yeah, so I, I think I can do the, the um, share screen here. So let me, uh, hang on a second. Let me um, go out of this and then I will do the share screen. Here we go. And it's just a cartoon little thing. I know it's in Hebrew, but it's, uh, oh, oh, what's happened? Here we go. Um, it's, it's a cartoon thing, but it's just a little celebration. Let me get us out of the way. Uh, wait, down here. And uh, where is the go button? Is it gone? All right. The 
They were just singing about the miracle, the eight days of light, and the, and the, the thing that they spin around is called a dreidel. It's, it has four little letters, and whatever letter it falls on, that's part of the game. But the four letters stand for a great miracle happened here. And uh, I like how they go back to the past and the family are all celebrating. So we get into the spirit of Hanukkah. Hallelujah. Well, so, all right. So what's interesting is that being that Hanukkah happened after Jesus, you know, his ministry. Oh, before, before. Oh, three, 300 BC. That's right. Okay. No, 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 no. No, Wait. about, uh, it was about 167 BC. Okay. 167 BC. Oh. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. Of course, right. Okay. All right. But then, yet it wasn't in the Old Testament? No, it was in what was called the intertestamental period between the Old oh, and the New. Thank you. So, um, yeah. so in other words, uh, but, yeah, we don't find that story written in the Old Testament books. Is that, uh, inter is that interesting that it's not in any Old Testament books? Something as significant well, as that? Well, the, the, no, the thing is, um, the, the minor prophets, they wrote about 700 BC. That was written in about 700 BC, okay? Um, and then after the, temp the first temple was destroyed and we were sent into exile, after we came back, there were no, when we were in exile, that's when the prophet and the kingly officers they got lost. After we came back from exile, they renewed and restored the, the kingly 
and uh, and then they had governors. So they were, there weren't any really known prophets. Uh -huh. And that's why we don't have any more books written that we call the Old Testament. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. All right. So uh, we will continue to pray for Anna. And uh, we're praying for your miracle. And this is a good time, Anna, for be praying for a miracle <laughs> during Hanukkah, right? And, um, and, and of course, you, Aharon, we keep you in our prayers and we um, thank, thank you. Would you. you mind closing us in? Yes. Could I, could I mention something real quickly? Um, for those of you that are not aware, Dutch Sheets is giving words out. It's 15 minutes oh, a day. I put, it, I put it in the email. Okay. It's an email. Just a reminder. I... It's been very powerful. <clears throat> Dutch Sheets, give him 15 on YouTube. Yeah. It's Praying been... for America. So yeah, it's, it's really a... powerful. Yeah. And yes, we're still believing our on that Trump will win four more years. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. We got to believe. Yeah. Amen, amen. Let's pray, everyone. Mm -hmm. Lord God, we lift up before you um, the uh, the situation, the the political situation in the United States. It's the ramifications, Lord. Either way, a massive. But you know that, Lord, you are on the throne you are high and lifted up and the train of the robe fills the temple lord and the seraphim cry holy 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 is the lord almighty the whole earth is filled with your glory and lord we thank you for the glory of your word we thank you for the glory of this message and how lord you came you took on flesh and you wash the disciples' feet and how you wash our feet, Lord. We thank you for that privilege. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, wants to uh, lovingly um, clean up our lives, not just save us, but to clean us up, Lord. And uh, it's painful at times, Lord. It's uncomfortable. Uh, and especially, Lord, when you use other people in our lives that we we, we may not have chosen, but you've chosen them. And uh, Lord, help us to, um, Lord, help us to, uh, to go through the process of what's needed, Lord, because we, we, are, we have been defiled, Lord. We have been defiled. The enemy uh, who wants to steal, kill, and destroy has defiled us. And we live in a world where defilement is all around us, death. The, the power of the tongue, the power of uh, the, the, the principalities and the powers and the rules, rulers of this world are all out to destroy and to defile us. And uh, Lord, you've given us more keys today, Lord, how to uh, protect ourselves from the defilement and what to do when we get defiled, not to feel condemned, but come straight to you and find cleansing, find washing. And we thank you, Lord, that our eternal salvation is protected by the blood. And we thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us in that respect. So, Lord, bless the word and help us, Lord. And when we see others, Lord, that are needing, that are needing their feet washed, Lord, help us to be sensitive and discerning. And, Lord, help us not to think that we're any higher or mightier or better than anyone else. But Lord, to remember that you, you took off your garments, Lord. You made yourself vulnerable and naked because you know who you, you are, Lord. You know where you came from and where you're going. And may that be the basis of all our ministry, Lord, that we know who we are in you and that we're not trying to prove that we're anything better or worse or more important, Lord, but that we're all brothers, we're all sisters, we're all sinners saved by grace. Lord, we do while we're praying here, we want to lift up. Firstly, Lord, we want to lift up our sister Anna. Lord, we want to see, Lord, healing in her life and recovery. And we ask for a miracle touch in her body and her life, Lord, wherever she needs it. We ask for a special healing touch in the precious name of Jesus. We ask, Lord, for her and Lord, anyone else in our group, Lord, that uh, has a need, emotional, spiritual, physical, financial, Lord. Lord, as we think of Hanukkah, this dedication, as we dedicate ourselves to you and we bring the little that we have, the little oil, 
the little grace, the little strength, the little money, the little everything we have, Lord. But Lord, with you, we know that there is an endless supply. There's an endless supply, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, lastly, we want to pray for the elections, the United States, because we know of the consequences, Lord. And Lord, we do believe, Lord, that uh, uh, Donald Trump is standing up for the biblical principles that are needed, Lord. We don't know what your will is, Lord, but Lord, we know that, um, as you said, let the church hear what the spirit is saying to the church. And we're hearing lots of leaders in the church, the prophetic voice. Lord, you said that the Lord will do nothing except he reveal it to the prophets. And Lord, we're sensing, we're believing, we're discerning there's too many voices that are hearing and believing the same thing, that Donald Trump is going to get reelected and he's the man. And Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would turn the hearts of the people, Lord, especially those uh, people in, in uh, the judges, the people in, in high positions. Lord, we want to pray for the lawyers of Donald Trump, who we know are very strong believers. They're looking to you for wisdom, for counsel, for guidance, for strength. Lord, we lift them up. We, we lift up their arms. We pray for strength. We pray for wisdom. We pray for strategy. We pray for favor. Lord, that you would turn this around. Lord, a lot of the miracles in the Bible, are uh, when it looks like, like Esther, like uh, uh, the Egyptians uh, chasing the Israelites at the Red Sea, but you turn things around. This is the miracles, Lord. And we ask for a miracle during this feast of Hanukkah, Lord, that this would be a new beginning and that people would know the light, the light of your word and the light of the, the Christians who are speaking in your name, standing up in your name, Lord, that people would know, like you said, that then the nations will know that I am the Lord, that they would know that this is a supernatural turnaround. Lord, we can only ask, we leave it into your hands, but we're asking because we believe and we're asking in the name of Jesus. Lord, bless my brothers and sisters here and those that are listening to this, Lord. We, we, I, I, we sanctify ourselves, Lord, for you. Thank you that you sanctified yourself for us. And now, Lord, I pray, Yevarechacha Adonai Yishmarecha. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace, shalom. In his precious name we pray. Amen.